by Sri Lanka's best internet package for online learning and online working with many amazing offers. Call 1212 for more information. Sri Lanka Telecom. Lenka, tu kuma wedi karaga ne? Lao ju rupyal panhata du kala. Mama, en api te ekak bom. Tonight, the Great Rift. Former President and Prime Minister's hatred towards each other revealed before the Presidential Commission probing these to Sunday attacks. Last chance. Three wheelers and motorcycles get an additional lane as traffic lane system rehearsals come to an end ahead of the real deal on Monday. A step in the right direction. Sri Lanka makes progress in human capital gains, beating the South Asian and lower middle income countries average. Weather turns, heavy deluge and gusty winds to come in the coming days. There's a tropical cyclone over there with taxi caution. All that and much more coming up on First at Nine, this Friday, the 18th of September, 2020. Nava Sunlight Sakura, then Dikukal Pavatina Sakura Malsuandin. From Ada Verona, this is Ada Verona First at Nine, live from Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening and welcome to First at Nine. I'm Dham Kekanayaka. Now the rift between former President Maitripala Sirisena and former Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe was exposed at the Presidential Commission of Inquiry probing the Easter Sunday spate of terror when former Defence Secretary Hemasiri Fernando testified before it. He said that the duo had a deep hatred towards each other following the 52-day government of 2018. The Commission also heard that the former President gave instructions to not invite Prime Minister Vikramasinghe and then State Minister of Defence to the Security Council. Meanwhile, former Chief of National Intelligence Cicero Mendes told the Commission that he first heard of the attacks from a relative. Former Chief of National Intelligence Cicero Mendes gave evidence before the Presidential Commission of Inquiry probing these to Sunday terror attacks for the seventh day yesterday. During the proceedings, the legal counsel representing Director of State Intelligence Nilanta Jayavardhana asked the witness as to how he came to know that an attack had been carried out on Easter Sunday in 2019. Cicero Mendes replied that he came to know of the attack via a relative of his from an area of one of the blasts. When Jayavardhana's legal counsel asked whether the witness didn't feel ashamed in being updated on such an important piece of information via a relative, Mendes said that it is normal to obtain information from a person in the vicinity of an incident when such a thing occurs. Then the chairman of the commission asked the witness whether his mobile phone was deactivated until the attacks since the day before. Cicero Mendes replied saying that his mobile phone was on silent mode since the evening of the 20th of April and that he did not have the chance to check the phone for incoming calls. Afterwards, it was the turn of former Defence Secretary Hermesiri Fernando to give evidence before the Commission. He was asked whether the intelligence information provided by a foreign source on the 14th of April in 2019 was discussed at the intelligence review meeting held on the 9th of April. The witness responded, quote, Nilanta was responsible for taking that information up for discussion since it was information received by him. The 8th of April in 2019 was a special day for the country's Ministry of Defence since until then the Indian Defence Secretary had not visited this country. The Defence Ministry was busy. It was in such a backdrop that the Chief of National Intelligence met me and informed of the piece of intelligence. I perused it and said that it is very important and asked him to tell Nilantha to take it up at the meeting the next day. At the meeting the next day, Nilantha during his turn said that Zahran's extremism is turning towards violence, but he didn't say that he is a terrorist. Likewise, he made no mention of the information he received on the 4th of April. Towards the end of the meeting, Cicero Mendes showed me the piece of information received on the 4th of April, which was in his hand. Then I asked Nilantha as to what was done about that piece of information. He replied saying, Sir, I have told the IGP. Another report is being compiled and it will be sent after completion. So I was content with it. Unquote. Former Defence Secretary Hemisiri Fernando went on to say, quote, 
By March 2019, Army Commander Mahesh Senanayakar had told me that the State Intelligence Service does not provide information and that they are bypassed. I told him that I will give a reply after talking it out with the President." Unquote. The Commission then asked the witness whether he discussed the matter with the President. Fernando responded, quote, No, I did not get a chance to talk it out with the President. A rift had been created between the President and me by external factions. As such, the President did not want to talk with me. Then IGP Pujit Jayasundra only participated in the first National Security Council meeting that I attended as the Defence Secretary. The President had given me instructions not to call him for meetings thereafter. Following the constitutional crisis of October 2018, both former Prime Minister Ranil Vikram Singha and State Minister of Defence Ruan Vijayvardhana were not invited to the Security Council. After the government change in October, I asked the former President whether to ask new Prime Minister Mahinda Rajpaksha to attend the Council. The President replied that it is unnecessary and said it can be done later." Unquote. In any case, the former Defence Secretary said that PM Rajpaksha was not invited to the Security Council during the 52-day government. The state's additional Solicitor General then asked the witness whether non-permanent members of the Security Council, who did not receive special invitation, attended the Security Council during his tenure of participation in the Council. Former Defence Secretary Hemisir Fernando responded, quote, one day, as we were seated until the President's arrival, we were surprised to see four persons walking in behind the President. They were representatives of the Sri Lanka Freedom Party. The President represented Dayasiri Jayasekara, Lasantala Givanna, Mahinda Amaravira and Tilanga Sumatipala. They were not invited to the National Security Council. When Ranil Vikram Singh became PM after the 52-day government, I met the President and said, Sir, even when Madam Chandrika became president in 2002, Ranil Vikram Singh attended the Security Council. The reply was, no, no, it's okay to be called for that. I won't call him for this. By then, there was deep hatred between the president and the PM. As officials, we too were caught in that, unquote. The additional Solicitor General then asked the witness as to what was the reason behind IGP Pujit Jayasundra not being called for the Security Council. The witness said, quote, during a Security Council meeting, then Chief of Defence Staff Ravi Vijayagunaratna made a complaint against an officer of the Criminal Investigation Department saying that a certain officer is attempting to arbitrarily arrest him. The President then told IGP Pujit Jayasundara to remove Nishanta Silva. Since what the President says must be done, the IGP transferred Nishanta Silva to Nigombo. It was also communicated to the Police Commission in line with the due protocol. Three days later, the President called me and asked under whose instructions Nishanta Silva was transferred. I told him that it was he who asked for it. He said he didn't ask for him to be transferred and slammed the phone down. Later, I went to meet with the President on several days. The President told me, look at what he has done. He has written to the Police Commission with reference to the Security Council. He instructed me not to call the IGP for the Security Council anymore. Accordingly, I communicated the President's order to then IGP Pujit Jayasundara. Instead of the IGP, Senior DIG Ravi Senaviratna, who was then in charge of the Criminal Investigation Department, was invited to the Security Council. Unquote. The additional Solicitor General asked the witness whether former President Maitri Pala Sirisena at some point asked him whether his head was not right. Former Defence Secretary Hemisir Fernando replied, quote, of course, on many occasions." Unquote. In the meantime, five individuals, including a lawyer, were remanded by the Colombo Magistrates Court yesterday for allegedly forging deeds and claiming a property owned by the Cinnamon Grand Hotel bomber. Enjoy a very smooth shave with the Big Easy 2 razor. Big Easy 2. Now, following heavy traffic on bus priority lane observed in the past four days, the police today allocated an additional lane for three-wheelers and motorcycles to use and cut down their travel time. With the lane system rehearsals coming to an end today, Senior DIG Deshabandu Tenakorn said that strict policing of the new rules will begin from next Monday onwards. The rehearsal of the lane rules was held today for the fifth day targeting four routes, namely Sri Jayavardhana Puramavata, Baseline Road, High Level Road and the Gore Road. Once again, traffic was monitored with the assistance of Sri Lanka Air Force drones and by means of CCTV cameras. However, just as in the past four days, some motorists along the bus priority lane were yet again seen not adhering to the new rules.
අපිට දීලා තියෙන්නේ වමේ මන්ත්‍රීවරු විතරයි නේ කාර් වෑන් ඒකෙත් දාගන්නවා අන්න ඒක නවත්තන්න ඕනේ නැත්තම් මන්ත්‍රීවරු හොඳයි හොඳයි නේ වෙලාව තමයි පොඩ්ඩක් පරක්කු වෙන්නේ එක ස්පේස් එකක් කෙහෙම් පිටින්ම දෙනවා ඒකේ වාහනයක් නැහැ එතකොට VIPs ලා විතරක් ඒ කියන අපි වැස්ස තෙමි තෙමි ඉන්නෝනේ ඒක පොඩ්ඩක් ප්‍රැක්ටිකලි හිතලා කරා නම් හොඳයි නේ The police had earlier instructed three wheelers and motorbikes to only use the left lane reserved for buses. However, heavy traffic has been observed along it in the past few days. However, following a study conducted by the University of Moratua and the police, more space was allocated for three wheelers and motorcycles to travel on today. ये साउथ से पहुंचा का चावल दी तीर ने कर गया था मैं तो एक वंपस मंत्री रूप आमना बस रात्र वाले त्रिविल रात्र वाले सह यात्रु पैदी पर डबादी में प्रमाण वात्वे नए किन कारण आवे त्रिविल संख्या वसह यात्रु पैदी संख्या पे लोग गणने के लिए मक्का पिकरा ये अनुवाय एक प्रमाण वात्वे नतीसा आदेदाव से दिया भी है मैं आतदा बेली में दी वंपस मंत्री रूप अमतर रहे देवनी मंत्री रूप से त्रिविल सह यात्रु पैदी वाले गमन करने अवस्था हो दूंगा शिक्षा क्रम में ये मारुवे में गमन करने त्रिविल रिद्रोण सह यात्रु पैदी रिद्रोण अदाव से निरीक्षण हो ये तो कोट मंत्री रूप देखा कि न मारे को वाले देखा कि न अवस्था वे दी पिरापारी दी में वंपस मंत्री रूप गमन करे तो ही अरे अनेक वाहन वाले न अवस्था वे दी इलेक्ट मंत्री रूप लगा दी The lane system rehearsals that began on Monday will conclude today and from Monday the 21st the rules will be strictly enforced against errant motorists Meanwhile director of police traffic division in Colombo DIG Sumit Nisankar revealed the new steps that will be used against traffic violators from Monday onwards He revealed that CCTV camera systems will be utilized to detect traffic violations and identify the motorists First time violators will not be fined immediately but will be made to attend a classroom session held by the police. He added that notice to attend the classes will be sent to the violators home. Repeat violators will be given spot fines or failing that legal action will be instigated against them. We will see you shortly after this break. Bear with us. Salem Bank, the bank with a heart. Welcome back. You're watching First at Nine. Now, Sri Lanka has made progress in human capital gains as a child born in Sri Lanka today will be 60% as productive when growing up as compared to if he or she enjoyed complete education and full health. This is higher than the average for South Asia region and lower middle income countries as stated in the World Bank's latest Human Capital Index report. It however stresses that the island must accelerate with better nutrition and learning outcomes. First launched in 2018, the Human Capital Index measures the amount of the human capital that a child born today can expect to attain by age 18. It conveys the productivity of the next generation of workers compared to a benchmark of complete education and full health. According to the index a child born in 2020 worldwide can expect on average to be 56% as productive as he or she could be when growing up. The Human Capital Index finds that a child born in Sri Lanka today will be 60% as productive when growing up as compared to if he or she enjoyed complete education and full health. The number is higher than the average for South Asia region and lower middle income countries as well as the worldwide productivity average of a child born in 2020. According to the World Bank, six components have come into play in order to determine the human capital index. Firstly, probability of survival to age 5. 99 out of 100 children born in Sri Lanka survive to age 5. Secondly, the expected years of school. In Sri Lanka a child who starts school at age 4 can expect to complete 13.2 years of school by his or her 18th birthday. Thirdly harmonized test scores they are measured in trends in international mathematics and science study equivalent units where 300 is minimal attainment and 625 is advanced attainment. Students in Sri Lanka score 400 on a scale. Learning adjusted years of school is also among the six components calculated by multiplying the estimates of expected years of school by the ratio of most recent harmonized test scores to 625. In Sri Lanka the expected years of school is 8.5 years. Considering the adult survival rate across Sri Lanka, 90% of 15 year olds will survive until age 60. Lastly, healthy growth 83 out of 100 children in Sri Lanka are not stunted. 
However, the index also points out that Sri Lanka must accelerate with better nutrition and learning outcomes. Speaking on the index, the World Bank country director for Maldives, Nepal and Sri Lanka says that stunting due to chronic undernutrition and the need for higher quality learning are the two areas of the human capital index in which Sri Lanka has an opportunity to accelerate progress, especially as a country on the threshold of upper middle income status. To help address these gaps, a strategic focus on improving nutrition and enhancing learning in less developed regions of the country is needed, along with consistent measurement of stunting and internationally comparable learning outcomes. Globally, due to the pandemic's impact, more than one billion children have been out of school and on average could lose half a year of schooling, translating into considerable monetary losses in the future. The analysis also finds that human capital outcomes for girls are on average higher than for boys. In Sri Lanka, the World Bank is supporting initiatives to increase access to early childhood education and care, to improve learning in general education and to strengthen the relevance of higher education for economic development. Now, the Department of Meteorology forecasts the showery and windy conditions of the island to enhance from today until the beginning of next week. It cautions of a low-pressure zone created over northeast Bay of Bengal as a result of a tropical cyclone that is currently present in the West Pacific Ocean. Despite the sporadic rainfall brought on by the southwest monsoon conditions, which was experienced by the country over the last few weeks, extreme weather conditions were not seen. However, the Department of Meteorology forecasts rainfall between 100 to 150 millimetres in the central Sabaragamu and western provinces and in the Gaul and Mathara districts from today. Windy conditions exceeding 70 km per hour are also expected across the island and around the sea areas from today until Monday. As such, members of the public, naval and fisheries communities are urged to stay vigilant. Temporary enhancement of rainy condition is expected over southwestern part from today onwards. A very heavy rainfall exceeding 100 mm are also likely in central Sabaragamua, western province and also in Golan Mathur district. In addition to that, strong gusty winds exceeding 70 km per hour is also likely across the island as well as the area surrounding the island. So we have already issued three advisories uh, for land as well as uh, sea areas. So general public as well as the naval and fishing communities are requested to be vigilant in this regard. Meanwhile, the Department of Meteorology also warned of a possible formation of a low-pressure area over the northeast bay of Bengal from Sunday onwards. However, Director of the Department of Meteorology, Shiromani Jayavardhana, says that this low-pressure zone will not have any direct effect on the country. At the moment, there's a tropical cyclone over the West Pacific Ocean and then there will be a low pressure area going to be formed over the Bay of Bengal from 20th onwards. And because of these two weather systems, this temporary enhancement is expected. There's no direct impact over because of these two weather systems, but as indirect impacts, we can expect increasing strong gusty winds at times and increasing rainfall. In the meantime, Deputy Director of the Disaster Management Centre, Pradeep Kodipili, urged the public in areas with the risk of landslide to be vigilant of the signs of landslide and to move from those areas to safer locations. People who are at the risky areas for the landslide has to be very vigilant with the prevailing weather situation, especially for the signs of the landslide. If signs been observed, they need to move from these locations. Slanting trees, cracks of the ground, sudden muddy springs could be the signs of the landslides. And the north province and the north central province also will be expecting some rain. And we have alerted all the disaster management units and military and the police and all the equipment's been standby to face upcoming situations. And 117 call center number is completely open for the disaster information mechanism in 24-7 basis in three languages. We will see you shortly. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're watching First at Nine. Now, President Gotabi Rajpaksha today instructed state banks to set up a lending scheme which enables people to purchase houses at an annual interest rate of 6.2% with a maturity of 30 years. The president also criticised both the state and private sector over their quality of work, saying various projects meander owing to backsliding. The head of state therefore insisted that those involved in such projects should be pushed to achieve the desired outcome. 
A discussion between President Gotabe Rajapaksa and representatives of the Ministry of Rural Housing, Construction and Building Materials and Industries Promotion was worked off at the Presidential Secretariat. During the talks, ministry representatives said that they plan to construct 1,500 housing units in areas of Varalavatta, Mihindupura, Parangiya Kumura, Dahayagama, Mattegoda, Soisapura and Tangal under the Super Housing Program to coincide with the World Habitat Day which falls on the 5th of October. President Gotabe pointed out the importance of having both the government and the private sector involvement in the project. He also instructed state banks to set up a lending scheme which enables to buy houses at an annual interest rate of 6.25% with a maturity of 30 years. State Minister of Housing Indikan Ruddha said that under the theme, A House for You, A Tomorrow for the Country, 14,022 houses are currently being constructed for the low-income earners at Grama Niladari level. However, the President said that he is disappointed to see the meandering pace of construction from both the public and private sectors. Parval, Vishal Pramanya Khadana, Bridges, Vishal Pramanya Khadana, Geval Deng Hadana, Water Projects Tina, Vau Hadana, Private Sector Una, Quality Eka, Nani Badak Paraduna, Hamadame and Ara, Par, them Masaki Yad, Eka Dakwat Hadane. I think Hemo Nama, the Eka Government Nemi, Contractors Locom, Private. Sector kita di luar tiennni, abai weda kerani. Mereka tamai me apa mulu rata emat ini na prasne weda no kiri. Private sector kebawa, government sector kebawa, kerani na weda. Me Kolombo unak belua ma, besar building tika tienna weda na iyan ni na. Iti me ma pushkara an ni weno. Hade ni tienna building tika ada anda. Ikman tak. Meanwhile, President Gotabia engaged in discussions with small and medium scale tea factory owners and exporters today on enhancing the quality of tea. Tiga-tiga mangai ada budhi, warta ino ne hamada. Iden ek teh factories, allah teh factories allah sini ek kelua, tawhana dek kelua, memaki ada iden eva mula in dalam trace kal lah. Ini semua arrest keran no. Meka thari itu nikang drugs kerana wagi, iden budukari allah no wagi, meka allah no. Mungkin meka itu mana damage ke bisala ini. Kau yang ini muda lali kene kute business nanti unai kiala, pete mulu rata ke. आधायम राटक नम थेवल वाट्मेक नतिकरन बैनी The Board of Investment of Sri Lanka has signed an agreement with a private company to set up a sea cucumber processing factory for the export market. The project, with an initial investment of 1.2 million US dollars, will be set up in Jaffna. The project, sea cucumber, is harvested mainly in the north and east sea belt by especially trained divers and in the seabed. They will be processed to the required dry stage in the state of the art factory, which will be established in the Jaffna Peninsula. Now, Sri Lanka's stocks closed 1.12% higher today on index heavy Browns investment, HNB Finance Limited, and LOLC Holdings pushing up the market. The all share price index closed 63.38 points up at 5,722.04. The main index stated low at 5,678.68 at the beginning of trading for the day, but continued to increase on volatile trading throughout the day. The more liquid S&P SL20 index closed 1.30% at 2,512.32. 2 now here's a brief report on how the market performed during the week. During the week, the SPI gained 5.2% mainly due to price gains in counters such as distilleries, Melster Corp and Expolanka Holdings. Meanwhile, the S&P SL20 increased by 6.5%. The average daily turnover for the week was up from last week to 3.2 billion rupees. Bank sector recorded the highest sector turnover during the week, while the second highest was seen in the capital goods sector. Furthermore, the foreign participation remained at subdued levels, with foreigners closing as net sellers, where foreign selling accounted for 19% of the total weekly turnover.
And that's it from all of us here at First at Nine. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.